All right, great. Well, welcome, you guys, and welcome to everyone here. Um, I'm Becky Buckman. I run marketing and communications for Battery Ventures out of our Silicon Valley office. Um, like Neeraj, though, I have New York City roots. I grew up in New Jersey. Um, I used to work for the Wall Street Journal down in the World Financial Center, um, which is visiting, actually, Fortune magazine down there today. Uh, but now I run all our um, internal, external um, comms branding efforts, and I'm really excited to be hosting this panel today um, on bottoms up selling. Um, I think the previous discussion about culture to what struck me most was that it seems like building a great company culture is a bit of a journey with lots of ups and downs and tweaks along the way. And I think building a B2B sales model could maybe be thought of in the same way. Um, we're gonna focus on bottoms up selling, which I think is the model that both of you guys kind of use at the beginning to fuel your growth. But I think we'll find, uh, hopefully we can talk about some of the changes that have happened in your sales model. So I'll introduce our panelists, but let them kind of like Jessica did tell you what their companies do. Um, I think they are hard to explain to your grandmother, so they're gonna do a better job than me. So our first panelist is um, Clark Valberg. He's the CEO of Envision App, based in New York. Clark, why don't you tell us what Envision App does? Sure, Envision is a, a digital product design and collaboration platform, so when companies wanna build the next thing that is in your pocket, they begin that process in Envision. They take their designs, they present their designs, they iterate on the designs, they build prototypes, and then eventually they bring their engineers in and they actually build it. So design is the new spec doc and Envision is the platform where that happens. All right, excellent. And um, Clark co-founded Envision in 2011 and prior to that he was a co-founder of Epicenter Consulting. Um, next we have Olivier Palmel, who's the CEO of Datadog based in New York and you employ about 100 people here. Why don't you tell us about Datadog? So we are a monitoring and analytics platform for developers and sysadmins. So basically anybody who's running servers or applications or public and private clouds, that's what we do. Okay, all right, sounds good. Well, let's talk about bottoms up. We're gonna talk about top down um, later in the afternoon. I feel like um, bottoms up selling can take a lot of different forms. We could be talking about selling to developers, having them pay on their credit card, very small purchases, all the way up to fairly sophisticated inside sales operations. Why don't you each tell us kind of the bottoms up model that you guys were using in the beginning that kind of helped you guys take off? So we started with the basic freemium. I mean, so we did this five years ago when freemium wasn't necessarily a foregone conclusion, right? The idea that you could actually give something away and not go out of business in a month wasn't necessarily uh, the given. Uh, so we start off with, uh, so this is all, am I echoing? It's a little, it could be a little echoing. All right, so it was jump in here. Um, we also had the advantage or disadvantage of kind of trying to create a market the idea of design was very much an individual practice, not something that whole organizations were involved in. So we had to convince people to give it a whirl, try it out with their teams. I mean, this is pretty common nowadays. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so free, forever, use it as much as you want as an individual, and then eventually pay us a little money to use it a little more broadly, and then eventually tip into enterprise. Okay, all right, Olivier? So we actually never, never started with a really free product. So the way, the way it works for us is that we have a free tier, uh, which is limited in the number of servers you can, you can run on it. Uh, but the truth of the matter is that you either have you know, less than five servers, which is the free tier for us, or you have more than five servers. Uh, but you don't decide you know, whether you have less or more. So you either not on target customer or just someone we used to see the market, in which case you're a, uh, you have less than five servers and it's free, or you're not, in which case you have to pay for the product. But everybody has got a free trial. So from the beginning, when we started selling the product, we had a combination of some self-serve for the free tier and also for the, uh, the low end of the, of the paying tier. And we also had some inside sales um, that started with you know, us, not inside sales people, just with the founding team initially. Um, but we also had some inside sales behind that to help the uh, people in, um, that were in our paying tier, comfortably in our paying tier, uh, getting from trying the product to actually putting a credit card in and, and starting paying. And the, the, your inside sales operation now, is it truly all inbound meeting people who, you know, you're, you're giving people, people are giving webinars and things like that. I think you told me that um, you feel like there's cold call fatigue in the market right now. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's mostly inbound. Uh, we do some outbound too, where we try to, read to, uh, to reach out to uh, you know, companies that otherwise wouldn't cross our path. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a, uh, I mean, it's really, it's really a combination of the two. I think it's harder to, the, to, do, to do outbound. Um, it's also something that's not necessarily, you know, if you do it the old fashioned way, it's not something that's, that, that is desired by your customers. Mm -hmm. um, everybody hates you know, getting the uh, phone calls in the morning from salespeople, that, I think that's right. pretty ubiquitous. Um, but you know, there are ways to actually reach out to companies and, and see the accounts, even when they are not you know, falling into your marketing funnel. So. Okay, all right. 
Um, Clark, talk to us a little bit about any, any inside sales for you guys? Yes, or, yeah. tons. Okay. Uh, so we didn't start that way. So we started okay. with totally just organic and people signed up and they used the product as individuals. You know, the consumer today is the same consumer that uses your product inside a company, the same consumer that uses some product for entertainment at home, right? Mm -hmm. They're very confident, they're competent, they're self-motivated. If they have a problem at work, they will try to solve that problem themselves. Mm -hmm. They'll start using the product. They'll either by explicit uh, intention or just kind of organically spread that product within their department. Mm -hmm. And then kind of the sale begins with that. But so enterprise, we, we layered on when the product really needed it. I mean, your, your product is your best CRO, right? Mm -hmm. So when the companies that used our product required more kind of infra infrastructural sophistication or product sophistication, we added kind of people to solve the how do I use this product with my entire company problem. Right. But that sounds like it's a customer by customer case instead of a growth of the company. We reached this inflection point. We had to do enterprise sales. So, so the product, the enterprise product came first. We offered that enterprise product to people who already used our non-enterprise, our self-serve product. Mm -hmm. And then the self-serve product became the source of all leads, I guess, all the okay. product qualified leads for the enterprise products. Okay. Olivia, you guys also now are doing some top, top yes, down, right? That's completely a function of who the customer is, right? Yeah. So we, when we started selling, so we, we started selling to companies that were uh, in public or private class, which tended to be mid-market, like West Coast, next generation mid-market companies. And, and today what's happening is that the transition from legacy IT to public or private class is something that's happening in, the, in all of the very large enterprises. And the large enterprises don't buy the same way as the, as the mid-market. So uh, you know, we, we actually have companies call us, like they're actually inbound, they call us and they tell us, hey, we're interested in the product, send us a sales rep. Um, <laughs> at a time where we didn't have anybody to sell, to send. So we said, what about a phone conversation with a 24-year-old instead? <laughs> Would you like that? Um, so we had to actually go and develop you know, an enterprise um, sales to actually go on top of the, of the inside sales. So it's completely different in terms of the, the kind of customers it reaches. Right, right. As far as hiring, I have to think hiring inside sales versus enterprise sales is quite different. I mean, what, what, are, the, what are the challenges, especially in New York, for you guys here? We don't hire in, yeah. inside sales. Our entire anymore. sales operations in Boston, I think, also. Huh. Same for us. Yeah. Why Boston? Well, because in New, in New York, it's actually great for enterprise sales. Um, so what happens is that most of the people who are really good end up either in, in enterprise sales or in, uh, uh, there's a lot of media sales and things like that, or ad sales. Um, IT, um, you know, IT transactional inside sales, there's not a ton of, of it here. Mm -hmm. There's much more of it in Boston. OK, OK. Um, and so what, it sounds to me like one of my questions was how, how do you get to the CIO or the CTO eventually? And it sounds like, at least in your case, Olivier, they're calling you sometimes. Well, it depends. I mean, it, we, 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 we sell bottom up, right? So for the bulk of our customers, even in the large enterprises, at some point, there's adoption that happens in the, among the rank and file, the people who actually manage the servers or the people who write the applications. So they're going to deploy the product, they're going to set it up in a bunch of different places, and it's going to grow, 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 grow in the organization. And typically, we, we don't wait until it reaches the, uh, the CTO or the, uh, the, the VP engineering before we, we, these, these people become customers. So they, someone puts a credit card in at some point, they start paying, we charge for usage, so it grows, 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 grows over time until at some point it gets, you know, it crosses a threshold, at which point the, the CIO or the CTO calls us and says, hey, I have that bill and it keeps growing, so okay. we need to do something about it. Um, okay. So at that point, we're not the ones reaching out to them, they're the ones reaching out to us. And they uh, and, and they're the ones. They want something basically. They want they want stability of the bill. They want a discount. They want you know the price agreements, right. SLAs. I don't know a whole bunch of things. But they're the ones asking for it. I think we had a question. Yeah, for the benefit of some of the other companies in the room who are going by themselves, how do you think about that critical mass? Is it a team? Is it a hundred developers scattered around the company? From both your experiences, yeah. what have you seen as the development? We had we had a, a few different experiences with that. So for us, what matters is where we enter in the enterprise. So. Um, we serve both developers and operations. Uh, if we enter on the developer side, uh, we'll have people kick tires forever. We'll have little pockets of you know five people here, ten people there, using the product on development environments, um, and people who are not really used to paying for stuff. You know, it's easier to get a developer to commit a month of their time to do something than to give you fifty bucks. Um, so that's that was wrong for us, and that it's really hard to build momentum, or it's, it takes a very very long time. When we enter through the, the ops team, which is what we, who we market to and who we you know, try to target basically uh, the accounts, um, the, the operations team will, de will, develop, will deploy us everywhere on production very quickly. 
Um, so from there, it's very easy to spread from team to team, basically, because the tool is there, you know, it's deployed, um, everyone can, can opt in, and when they opt in, then actually they can, they can move us to other environments, other applications, other departments, you know, other anything in the, uh, in the company after that. So for us, I mean, it's always designers. Designers bring our product in the door. So the, what determines whether or not they're an enterprise customer for us is really the sophistication of how they approach design. So if it's a really small um, team of designers at a really big company, we have the opportunity to use sales to educate them on the broader use of the product. And we might start with five users or 10 users and might actually just flip immediately into 1,000 users once we've educated them how they can best leverage the, the product for organizational conversation. So it has, sometimes it happens organi organically, and sometimes our, our sales actually becomes like customer success. Mm -hmm. What um, is the status of the tactic? How do you guys do um, working about account management? Do you use different um, inside sales or what you guys are calling yeah. enterprise sales? Is that what I was trying to call them? Okay. And where's the relationship management, especially yeah. around mm -hmm. corporate markets or what account players are you guys in the sales side? So for us, we actually, we have two different kinds of accounts. We have accounts where uh, we need to retain them and grow them, but we have everything already there. So for example, you know, Airbnb is a large customer of ours, but they have one product and one you know, production environment. So we can do all the selling we want to them. There's nothing else we can sell them. Like they, they have, you know, we have everything. So we want to make sure they're happy. We want to make sure we work the relationship. We want to make sure that they know what it was going to cost them to renew and when and you know, all of that sort of stuff. So it's more typical I would say customer success. Um, uh, on the other hand, we also have customers that are very large enterprises, uh, where we have you know, one team, you know, one team at GE or you know, things like that, or where there's actually a ton of selling that we can do, and and that's actually a very very different job, and it, it gets much closer to typical enterprise sales, and that's actually something right now. Initially, we plumped that with customer success. Um, we saw after a while that customer success was doing. A, they were not completely controlling the uh, the. Uh, the, they were responsible for revenue growth, but you know, they, they, they were clearly not able to achieve it in similar ways in different parts of their, of their accounts. So we're completely cutting that out now and, and moving that into something that's closer to enterprise sales, basically. And, and, and then the part is the, essentially, so then it's like, hey, let's have a conversation at the C-level with the execs yeah. and say, I can demonstrate the value. Here's a small team that's using it. Your whole company can have it. But they're coming in, instead of it being by themselves, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's actually a top-down thing. Yeah, exactly. So the, the trick there is when you switch from, you have to unlearn everything you learn. When you, when you do a, a bottom-up sale, um, you do land and expand, and you're happy to close whatever you get, uh, and you know, that's awesome, and then you let it go over time, and great, awesome. Uh, when you start adding some enterprise sales to that, you can't do that anymore. You shouldn't do that anymore. The wrong thing to do is to, um, to, uh, to start with one team that uses you, um, and then you go up to the, to the CIO, and then you ask the CIO for, hey, maybe another team. What about that? Uh, what you want then is you want everything. Uh, and it's a different conversation, and that's, uh, because if you get another team, then you're actually going to, uh, it's going to be difficult to come back for the others later on. So. What are the biggest mistakes that you guys feel that you made in bottoms up selling that could be lessons for other people here today? Clark, you want to start? I think probably you know not weaponizing the freeness aspect all the way, and this is something that you know we've learned over time and mm -hmm. leaned into. Just understanding the power of the virality of the product and making sure that all the parts of the product were unlocked to support yeah. that. Okay. Right, because ultimately, it's a moment, it's a moment, momentum game, and the enterprise department. I like I would like to not call them salespeople. I'd like to call them the human intervention team. Right, their job is to accelerate usage by getting in touch with sometimes decision makers that have been designated by the company to be decision makers, sometimes just advocates. Like, hey, this person would like to make more decisions about design. Again, in our world where there aren't necessarily, there isn't necessarily this rich, you know, articulate ecosystem of decision makers around design. I mean, sometimes, especially in agencies, there are roles like that, but sometimes just folks who feel strongly about design's presence inside the business, and we have to find those people and activate those people to spread the message. Olivier, what about mistakes, lessons for others? Well, mistakes we've made are we, so we started working really well with you know, inbound, inside, bottom up, um, and we just stuck to that for way too long. I mean, we could, we waited too long until we added some enterprise sales on top of that. We waited too long until we uh, we started doing some outbound addition to the inbound, and the problem is that you need to do it at some point, mm -hmm. um, but it's always easier to keep doing what you're doing right now. Right. And it's actually really hard to get to, to change the behavior in your teams. You know when you 
when you have inside sales reps that are used to, uh, to selling inbound, um, they don't have to think really about what they're doing. Right. You tell them, hey, please do some outbound in addition to that, but why would they? I mean, they're making money about selling inbound, so. Uh, it's also a totally different skill set, yeah. also. Are there signs, like, you said you wish you'd done it sooner. What are the signs you miss? Well, there, there's no signs, that's the problem. The sign is, at some point, you, you hit the ceiling, uh, but you don't know it until you've hit, you've hit it, so uh, okay. that's, that's the problem. Okay. Here. So what are you guys doing to drive sort of the initial trials before you even get to the bottom to start selling up? Like, um, do people just know about both your products now so they try it? Um, you know, I don't know how many people are like, oh, Datadog. Like, that's not like a small, like, I just download it and use it in one day thing, right? So, yeah. so what, how do you get that sort of pipeline going and filled at the top? So it's, 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 it's marketing, right? So it's a bunch of things. One is, of, I mean, there's the obviously the, uh, the the viral appeal of the product, you know, which is um, fueled by the, the free tier, which is a bunch of bunch of uh, individuals and students and, you know, are going to use it, so they're going to spread it. That's number one. Number two is um, so we, we target mostly companies that migrate from legacy IT to public or private clouds. Uh, everybody has to learn how a public or private cloud is working, and they do that one of two ways. They either go to conferences about that, or they Google. You know, stuff online about it. So, so how do I work with Elasticsearch on AWS or things like that. And so we do, we do event marketing targeted on the conferences um, that relate to these next generation technologies. And we also do a lot of content marketing around the, uh, the, the stuff they're going to Google. So the idea is you meet people at these events, you get all of, the, all of their information, then they're going to sign up on your product, and they, they turn into inbound leads on their own. So. Clark, you guys have done some pretty innovative marketing. Do you want to talk about some of the campaigns? Sure. And so I'll go back to that question. Yeah. I think I'll tie it in. But uh, so we've bifurcated our entire marketing department. So we have a VP of grand, brand and growth and a VP of enterprise marketing. So the brand and growth side is about content. It's about what we call cookies, kittens, and crack, like different kinds <laughs> of marketing vehicles. The cookies are the free things that we give away that are plentiful and delicious and hot and tasty, uh -huh. right? Like blog posts, right? The kittens are our gated content, downloadables, eBooks. Uh, webinars, that kind of stuff, and the crack. Are, these are the big moonshot crazy stuff like we uh, have created and are about to release a documentary about the design industry called Design Disruptors, which you can see at designdisruptors.com. Mm. And uh, so this is like, you know, let's meet with 51 designers at like the greatest companies in the world and make a movie. Like, let's actually make a, a real movie that we'll show in theaters. Um, that, that's crack, right? That's awesome. uh, <laughs> so we do these things to uh, create brand awareness, to get people to be willing to try the product to get, also with, when you're creating a market also, you have to get over the hump of, I don't have a thing like this that I'm replacing, right? Mm -hmm. You have a little bit of that, mm -hmm. right? Or you have, and especially in us, there isn't necessarily a vacuum. I wish I had better design isn't a, it's an opportunity more than it is a problem. Mm -hmm. So we have to get people over the hump of, I'm trying this product, I'm in, you know, taking in these practices, right? And then I'm spreading the product to other people, which is a long journey and requires a lot of careful nurturing. Other questions? Okay. Which is, um, <clears throat> being that you guys are both um, selling into enterprises and like, traditional design agencies or IT, there's a lot of channel involved in traditional um, IT worlds and also in agencies. How much sell-throughing do you guys do? Do you have a strategy around that? Do you guys have partners? Um, do you enable them? Do you fight with them? Are they? Our best partners are the implicit partners that we have. For example, companies that are just by, nef by definition have viral ecosystems, like agencies, for example. If we get into one agency, the turnover rate for designers and agencies, I don't know what it is exactly, but it's a lot, right? So if you find out about our product because you worked at one of these huge agencies, you'll be someplace else probably within the next six months to a year, and then the product spreads. So we actually put special attention into the cohorts that we know have a high natural organic virality. It's not really a channel, but um, it is a, an approach that creates the same kind of effect. And we, we've avoided channels for the longest time because it's, I mean, it just makes everything harder. Like it's, it, setting through a, a channel is like setting yourself up worse. Um, so the idea is you first have to get successful selling yourself, get everything in place, et cetera, et cetera, and then you can complement that with channels. In the US, it doesn't matter all that much. Um, it starts mattering a little bit for us now because you know some companies are migrated to, um, to public or private clouds by consultancies and MSPs and things like that. So that's starting to come up, which was not the case before. So we, we need to be there. 
Uh, but for the rest of the world, it's actually really, really important. So uh, there's lots of places where you're just not going to sell directly. You know, we're, we're not going to, uh, to have a sales force in Chile, you know, so we're, we're fine going to a partner there. But that's something that happens once you have a, the, 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 proof, the proof, the success in the US, the, you know how your sales are working, you know who your customers are, and then you can package that and have a slightly worse version of it still work. So. All right, go ahead. Hey, I'm uh, John Fanning from Hyatt. Um, you talked about bottom-up uh, and top-down selling. Um, what lessons have you learned about pricing? Because there can be very different sensitivities when you're selling in, for example, SMB, through to when you're then selling in enterprise. Have you, have you sort of learned lessons or changed things over time? That's really difficult pricing? because when you, when you price for bottom-up, you're not priced for enterprise selling. Um, you, you, know, you price for bottom-up, you're going to discount a little bit, but you know, people expect the price to be what it is, you know, your, the product to be what it is, and everything else. When you end up doing, when you start doing some top down, top down selling, uh, then everybody expects you know an 80 percent discount, and you know, and they're not <laughs> buying what your product does, but they're buying the strategic dream that they can put in front of the board in a pretty slide. Um, so the, the two clash quite a bit. So it took us quite a bit of time to figure out how to navigate that, and we end up with two different price points, two different offerings, and basically we package all the stuff that the uh, big enterprise care about, but no one else wants, um, and we put that into a, under a different price, and that's that's. Basically, the the only way we found to do it, but we still we're still struggling a bit with that. Yeah, so we, we did the same thing. We created two entirely different products. Right, uh, the enterprise product correlates really in two different dimensions with the ability to pay us more infrastructural sophistication. I need users and management and all kinds of security and things like that. And then let's go feature uh, embellishments that are related to users that are not necessarily the core design users. So organizational insight on design. So create a different product with a totally different seat model uh, and meaningful limitations, meaningful but, but loose enough to create virality limitations on the non-enterprise product. So you can use it with a bunch of people and it can spread to a point of critical mass on the non-enterprise product, but then at some point you hit into a wall, you flip into the enterprise product because you need security or because you need more of something, right? It's an entirely different seat model and then now you went from this organic free growth up to let's say, I'm gonna make a number up, 20 people into the now you probably need a thousand seats uh, with a totally different pricing model. All right, I think we're out of time. Um, I think Jessica may introduce the break, but I want everyone to please tweet cookies, kittens, and crap. Maybe that's the new <laughs> hashtag that we can. TM. Uh, trademark. All right, thank you guys, great insight. Thank you so much.